Glad they're able to do that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your spirit that's blessed us today and for your amazing creation. You've given these young people these talents and Pastor Adrian talents and us the ability to appreciate those talents. And our hearts have been blessed. Now, Lord, speak to us from your word that we might be merciful and do good. In Jesus' name, amen. How do you feel about wolves? Public opinion regarding their place and manner for wolves, it's, it's waxed and waned over the years with recent history typified with an almost an esteem and an awe and at times almost an idolatrous reverence for these amazing creatures. But what is reality about wolves? Is it the big bad wolf? Or is it the noble symbol of all that is free and good? Given this duality that comes to our minds, I understand that to try to use wolves as a metaphor today is to risk being misunderstood, as I have no doubts the big bad wolf was misunderstood, that is. He didn't really mean to destroy the houses of the pigs. He was just dealing with abandonment issues because the little pigs wouldn't open the door and let him in. And we don't know whether or not maybe straw and sticks are triggers for wolves. I know my dog always got excited when I picked up sticks, so let's not judge. Personally, I'm a big fan of wolves, having never actually met one in the wild. That's kind of how that works, isn't it? Yet for today, I'm going completely negative with the wolf metaphor. And so that we can be on the same page together, when I say dinner with wolves, which is our title for today, when I say dinner with wolves, I want you to imagine an insensitive, snarling pack of clannish speciesists who seriously need to check their predator privilege and stop drooling and howling every time a fat little piggy moves into a sturdy materials challenged home somewhere in their neighborhood. This is dinner with wolves, not dances with wolves, all right? You see the difference. Bad wolf. Big, bad wolf. We're on week three of our spring series, Tasting and Seeing. Sometimes life changes at the table. And this week, Jesus is dining with wolves. This is a small group series. And it's not too late. We've still got four studies to go. If you still want to get a group together, you can still do that. We have copies of the studies in the lobbies. You can find them on the church website. You can come on Monday to Pastor Steve's group or mine on Tuesday. Regardless of how we've come to see wolves today, and in truth, they're magnificent creatures who play an important role in their ecosystems, but regardless of how we see them today, the Bible takes a very negative view of wolves. Now, there's an important interpretive side note here. Because the Bible always describes wolves as a metaphor for bad things, does this mean Scripture teaches we should hate wolves? Okay, this is a trap. This is the trap of the unthoughtful biblical literalist. A model of interpretation that people will sometimes try to force on us. Just because the Bible consistently uses wolves as a negative metaphor doesn't mean the Bible teaches we should hate them and kill them. But there are people who use that kind of logic for other issues from the Bible. So remember, the next time you hear someone trying to use a claimed biblical literism as an attempt to justify irrational behavior, just because the Bible always talks bad about wolves doesn't mean we're supposed to hate them, all right? But back to the Bible and wolves. I think when so many of your readers, why is the Bible so negative on wolves? Well, I think when so many of the early people who received the messages of the Bible, and even those who were writing them, when their shepherds 
I think if most of you were shepherds, you wouldn't really like wolves. It's only when we watch them on TV that we seem to think they're beautiful. Ezekiel 22, verse 27, speaking of Jerusalem, her officials within her are like wolves tearing their prey. They shed blood and kill people to make unjust gain. Or here's Jesus warning his disciples, Matthew 10, verse 16. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. It takes wolves to make snakes look good. That's, that's how bad wolves fall in the Bible. But there's probably no reference to wolves that better suits what Jesus was to encounter in our text for today than these wolves mentioned by Jesus near the end of his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. The danger in having dinner with wolves is if you aren't careful, you won't be dining, you'll be dinner. That's how it works. And so in that context, I give you Jesus' dinner with wolves. Luke 14, verse 1. One Sabbath when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Very wolf-like behavior, isn't it? Waiting, looking for the chance to catch their prey. And I think they've set up a trap for Jesus, though the text doesn't say it directly, but, but you see if you agree with me. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Okay. There's no way this suffering man was there except as bait for Jesus. Because this is a gathering of Pharisees. And there's no way they just invited some guy who is obviously under a curse to just come over for a meal. So he's not there because they want him there. He's there because he's the bait. And it's quite obvious from this story right up front, this isn't one of those nice little get-togethers after church among friends. No, there are important things on the line today, which is the truth that will become obvious as this story progresses. The challenge for Jesus, though he will refuse their terms of the challenge is whether or not he will agree to play by wolf pack rules and thus find his appropriate place in the hierarchy of the pack or he will violate the pack rules and therefore be thrown out. Now, spoiler alert, Jesus isn't about to play by the pack rules. And in fact, he's about to attack the pack rules. And here's how Jesus starts his attack. His attack starts with an act of mercy. Is there anything more effective, to a, more, more offensive to a snarling pack of wolves than a blatant act of mercy? Don't think about wolves how we think of them. Think bad wolves. Big bad wolves. And in this act of mercy, an act that the wolves themselves seem to have set up for Jesus to perform, Jesus makes it clear from the start that he's not going to conform even if it would have been easy enough for him to do so. Why do I say easy enough? Well, consider the rest of this section. Luke 14, verse 3. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Jesus takes the bait. Jesus heals the man, and then he turns and challenges the Pharisees. Verse 5, Then he asked them, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Now I imagine at this point there was a bit of confusion. 
with the Pharisees who had laid the trap, suddenly not sure if Jesus had done the right thing or not, and simultaneously not sure what they think of his explanation. He gives it in the form of a question. But was it actually valid to justify his action? I'm going to read it to you again. Do you think the explanation Jesus gives is valid? Verse 5. Then he asked them, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Now, I know Jesus said it, so it has to be valid, right? I mean, we agree with that. And that's true enough. But I want you to realize something. If this is the fullness of how you wrestle with texts in the Bible, then you're simply accepting the authority basis for righteous act acting without actually wrestling yourself with what Jesus has done. And I'm happy we have the privilege to do this because we, by default, believe what Jesus did in his day was always right. But if this is all we have, this oversimplified thinking will not serve us very well at figuring out what is righteous acting in our day. We'll be clear enough on what Jesus should have done, but if we don't know why Jesus does what he does, how will we ever apply that thinking to our own lives? So I guess if you're ever at a banquet and there's somebody there with abnormal swelling, it would be okay for you to heal them. But if that's all you get from this, you haven't learned anything at all, have you? If we can only discern truth and righteousness based upon who has spoken a word or performed an act and are unable on our own to discern why something is either true or righteous, then we will necessarily always be forced to turn our free will over to some external authority willing to tell us which things are right and which things are wrong. And I want to tell you, in America right now, there's an awful lot of people on both sides of issues who have turned over their free will to someone else who is telling them what is right and what is wrong, and it seems the majority has lost their ability to discern for themselves. Don't worry. There will always be more than enough authorities eager to control your life in this manner. There's always an alpha wolf somewhere. So let's read it again. And let me paraphrase something I said a few weeks ago from the Bible that Jesus said. What is written in the Word? How do you read it? Verse 5, then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. I don't think I would have been a very good Pharisee because I lacked the self-discipline that it seemed to require. However, much too often for my liking, I seemed to be able to conceive of reality from their position pretty easily. And here is why Jesus' answer might well have left me unsatisfied, but also suspicious I was missing something important. The whole issue with the setup with the sick man was not whether or not Jesus was willing to heal a sick man, but rather whether he would do it during the sacred hours of the Sabbath, an act that would go against the pack rules on what is acceptable on Sabbath. That's the setup. And to this end, this trap is well laid. For though the man is suffering, it isn't like his condition is critical. It is literally not going to kill him to wait until tomorrow or to wait until the sun goes down to be healed. And Jesus, if he was going to play along with the pack rules, would clearly have done just that, waited till after the Sabbath was over to heal the man. But now let's just give that approach a little love right now, because in all likelihood, it's what most of us would have done had we been in Jesus' place. Some of the assumptions we might have, the assumptions we might have made that would have led us to that act. First, in order to be a significant leader within the pack, 
one must at least acknowledge the pack rules and in fact defer to them from time to time, right? You want to be a part of the pack? Learn the rules. And show deference. Second, and since it's better to have the wolves on my side than to have them against me, why not try to find a way to satisfy the pack rules since this isn't, in fact, a life or death scenario? Therefore, I'm going to take the man's number and see to it that he's healed first thing when the sun goes down. It would have no doubt been the expedient and easy choice and the best way for Jesus to have continued to gain higher and higher and higher standing in the pack. Look, he can heal and he appreciates the rules. But herein lies the problem. Jesus doesn't seem to appreciate what higher standing in the pack can get him. So much does he seem to not understand this fact that he goes on after this event and twice calls out the pack with its rules of hierarchy and order. We're going to read these quickly to establish the point. Verse 7, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In verse 12, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Both of these sayings of Jesus completely upend the pack rules, for they both speak against striving for supremacy and on behalf of acts of goodness and kindness and humility that when you do them, nobody may even notice you did it. You see, you don't gain standing in the community by inviting people to dinner who can do you no good. Yet these acts that Jesus is calling for are acts that have a power, but it's a different kind of power. It's not the power to make the one who does it famous, but instead it's the power to incrementally, bit by bit, little by little, change the world. For one thing, dinner is far more pleasant when half the room isn't feeling irritated because they had to sit in the less important seats. You think your pack is organized. These guys even knew which seat was honored and which seat was a disgrace. In addition, I suppose the world would be a nicer place for lots of the lonely and ignored people if those of us who have long-standing lists of standing invitations occasionally broke the payback model and reached outside of our circle to someone who gets left out. But then, since when was life in the pack about feeling good and doing good, right? Isn't it supposed to be about gaining praise and admiration and power? Which brings us back to the first part of the text, the part where Jesus heals the sick man. I made this statement earlier regarding Jesus healing the man. In this act of mercy, an act that the wolves themselves seem to have set Jesus up to perform, Jesus makes it clear from the start 
that he isn't going to conform, even if it would have been easy for him to do so. The easy way out for Jesus was obvious. Heal the man, but wait till after Sabbath. That will satisfy their rules and also make the man whole. And the only price, a sick man has to deal with his ailment a few hours longer. That's not too much to ask, is it? I mean, if it's an emergency, then by all means, Jesus, act now. But this is no emergency. And it is this line of thinking, or at least this definition of what an emergency is, that when followed causes the explanation Jesus gives to appear somewhat non sequitur. Consider again the words of Jesus. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. It is clear from what Jesus is saying that there is a threshold that everyone in that room is willing to cross when it comes to Sabbath rules. In an emergency, you're allowed to act. And it seems clear enough that a child or an ox in a well is a pretty serious emergency. In case you didn't know, you're not supposed to leave your child in a well till after Sabbath. That's bad parenting. Don't do it. It's a situation that requires immediate action. These described scenarios are literally life or death, aren't they? But is Jesus reasoning fairly to equate the sick man with these life or death scenarios? Well, I I suppose it depends on how you define an emergency, doesn't it? Was the drama with the... Was the man with the swelling in his life in a life or death drama? No. Or at least not one that involved his life. So from the standpoint of a Pharisee, it seems simple enough to ask him to wait till our sacred Sabbath is over before we help you. Doesn't it? That's reasonable. But it would seem that Jesus sees things a bit differently than we do. And whether you consider another hour of suffering an emergency or not, Jesus does. And it seems he is willing to act immediately to relieve discomfort even if the situation he's relieving isn't life-threatening. Jesus seems to me to be saying, if it is within your capacity to show mercy and do good, then show mercy and do good, regardless of whether or not it breaks the pack rules, even if showing mercy and doing good costs you standing in the pack hierarchy. Now, I'm certain that we, with our finely honed skill at self-justification, could easily misuse this train of thought to justify about anything that we wanted to do simply by claiming, well, that's a silly pack rule. And then redefining any action we take, regardless of how foolish it might be or selfish it might be, as being noble. I'm standing against the pack rules. I hope that's not the lesson you're getting from this today. Instead, I hope this is the lesson you're getting. Be merciful and do good every time you have a chance and stop worrying so much about your standing in the pack. Why? Because the kingdom Jesus wants us to build is not the kingdom of the wolves where it's all about power and position and who eats first and who eats most. Galatians 5, verse 15, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. That's the text of the kingdom of wolves. This isn't the kingdom we're building. Instead, we should be building the kingdom of God, the kingdom where the wolves stop acting like, well, wolves. Isaiah 11, verse 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, 
the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And what's going to happen? Here it is. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see, in the kingdom that Jesus is building, Sick men and women don't have to wait until we've satisfied our pack rules before they get the healing they so badly need. And if there's any striving in this kingdom, it is only striving to be merciful and gracious and loving to all inside the pack and outside the pack. And as for fame, that'll never be the motive. For often, in the kingdom of God, the greatest works go completely unnoticed. Nathan's home this week. We're pleased to have him home. Home from Andrews University. Has some friends with him. He shared a line with us last week from the end of the George Eliot novel, Middlemarch. A line that I think summarizes well what I hope you take from this message today. The comment is about Dorothea, the main character of the novel, and is made in the context of how she was kept by her choices from ever becoming well-known or famous. And in the context of the book, there is some question as to whether this is an affirmation or not. But in the context of Jesus' actions, I believe we should absolutely see this as a powerful affirmation. Here's the quote. It'll be on the screen. But the effect of her being on those but the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably I just can't say that. I've messed that up 3 times. Incalculably. There it is. All right, try again. But the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive. For the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts. And that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Here's what it means. It means as tough as you think your life is, it's not half as bad as it would have been if an untold number of people you don't even know their name had not made a series of good life decisions creating a world in which you can have as good a life as you have. And this day they lay in graves and you don't even know that their daily goodness made your life as good as it is. Here's the point. You matter. You matter to God and your contribution, whether it ever gets recognized by the pack or even noticed, no matter how small you think it is, your contribution changes the world. You might not ever get invited to dinner with wolves, and that might be a good thing. And it matters not... If no one ever visits your tomb, your contribution has made a difference. And the growing good in the kingdom of God is in fact partly dependent on your unhistoric acts. Just because your acts of righteousness have not been seen and appreciated here does not mean they are unknown. Jesus knows all your acts of righteousness. Amen. And like he promised in our text today, you will be repaid in abundance at the resurrection of the righteous. So don't be afraid next time you have dinner with wolves. Remember what Jesus said, Luke 14, 11, 
For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So here's what I want you to do. Be merciful, do good, and stop worrying about the pack. Let's pray. Father in heaven, give us hearts like Jesus who cared more about relieving the suffering of one man than he did about his standing amongst the wolves. May we be merciful and doers of good.